All right, it's time to start the party. Let's get going. My name is Rick Durfee here with Durfee Law Group, and we're going to spend the next few minutes talking about 50 shades of green dominate your asset protection. I hope you're here to have a good time and to learn some fun stuff about asset protection. I had some people ask me wh why I chose the color green, and as it turns out, there's kind of a statistical anomaly. The same number of people claim that green is their favorite color as yellow and blue combined. I have to tell you that up front that you cannot use anything I say here today to lie, cheat, or steal with the IRS. You're going to pay your taxes and you do not get a get out of jail free card with me. So when we talk about asset protection, which we're going to talk about today, some things we got to weigh and consider. First is, what the heck are we protecting? Then what are we protecting it from? And we're going to learn today about internal and external risk. Those are some interesting factors that play into our asset protection. And then who are we protecting it for? We do very different plans for people who have children versus people who don't have children, for people who have a business who don't have a business. So what we're protecting, what we're protecting it from, who we're protecting it for drives the plan completely. With this internal versus external risk, this is something that a lot of people just don't get. So I like to compare the concept to a good fence. A good fence keeps your dog in and the neighbor's dog out. With asset protection, we want to contain risk so risky things don't spill out and contaminate the good stuff. And we want to exclude risk so that we can wrap things that are valuable and important in, in an entity or in a structure so that if there's some risk event outside, it doesn't get in and hurt us. And that, those principles, that principle drives everything we do in asset protection. And by the way, I, I tried to come up with some good jokes about 50 shades of green, but all of them were too off color to tell here. So I want you to think about what happens. Why, why is it that some businesses fail and others don't? Some marriages succeed and others don't. And some families are able to handle large amounts of money and they do really well with it while others get a little bit of money and it just messes them up. These are big things and they, they tie back to those questions. What are we protecting? What are we protecting up from and who are we protecting up for? Those questions and these same issues here, why, why does it succeed some places and not succeed others are tied together. So I want to introduce this with a story. There was once a tree, a beautiful tree, 50 shades of green on this tree. And it produced money. And there were two families that experienced this money tree and had two very different experiences. The first one, a small child collects money and spent it, consumed it, ate it up, used it, and acquired an entitlement mentality. I'm entitled to this money. And one of the things that happens with entitlement, dependency breeds contempt. If you become dependent upon a source of money that you did not produce, you come to detest and hate that source of money, which is an interesting factor in intergenerational con conflict. So as soon as this young man had the opportunity, he cuts the tree down and he burns it up. He consumes it. When he hits midlife, the tree doesn't produce anything anymore. And so he's just mad. And in the end, he's just an old man bitter, poor, living in his poverty. On the other hand, another young man, the beautiful money tree, delivers him some money. And what does he do with it? Instead of consuming it, he plants it. He learns that there's something to do with money other than have a good time. And he nurtures that little tree, and as his family comes along, he helps it grow. And finally, in his old age, He's able to enjoy the fruit of his labor and you see the benefits and blessings that come to his children and his family. So two families, two completely different experiences with the same money, the same opportunity. And I bring this up because if we are very clever and we protect our assets and we avoid taxes and we prevent probate and and we do all this stuff to accumulate this wealth and pass it on to future generations, and it just messes them up and turns them into 
spoiled, rotten, good-for-nothing, entitled trust babies, we have not done anyone any favors. We're going to go to the trouble and the expense and the aggravation of living prudently and carefully ourselves and protecting our money and pass it to the next generation. We want to make sure that when we do, we get the results that we really want. As it turns out, and we're going to talk about this some more, how we pass money and wealth to future generations has a huge impact on what it does to them. And we do not get multi-generation growth and multi-generation healthy uh, relationship with wealth by accident. That always happens on purpose. So to introduce these principles again, where, where do we start? And this is curious, and I, I speak about this all over the country. I should tell you that I, I'm only licensed to practice law in Arizona, but I represent clients in all 50 states and a number of uh, non-U.S. jurisdictions, uh, and that's possible for a variety of reasons, but I can help you no matter where you live. And something I encounter when I review trusts and planning the people have done, they don't know where to start. And the reality is that the easiest things to prevent or the easiest risks to protect against cost the least to avoid. Kind of like if you don't want to be bit by a shark, stay out of the water kind of stuff. That doesn't cost you anything and you can completely avoid the shark bite. So there are some very plain and simple things we can avoid, risks we can prevent or protect against, and it costs us very little. And we should start there. And if, in fact, we don't start there, we're wasting our time and our money. So I want you to contemplate what I call the money pyramid. Everybody wants money. People who say they don't want money will lie about other stuff, too. Everybody wants it. But few are able to make it, and among those who make it, even fewer are able to keep it. And among those who make it and keep it, fewer still are able to pass it on to their children. And among those who successfully pass their wealth on to future generations, fewer still are able to cause that wealth to be something good instead of something bad. Very often the wealth transferred from one generation to the next is a curse. And it takes leadership to do that, and very few people are able to do that which is kind of why I focus this planning again. I, I hate handing people a hammer if all they're going to do is hit their fingers with it, and when they're done mash, smashing their own fingers, start to hit the fingers of their children. So what are, the, what are the big risk factors here with wealth? What's going to destroy wealth? What's number one? I want to open this to the audience. What's number one? What's the biggest number one thing that's going to destroy wealth? Anybody? Lack of maturity and knowledge. Nice try. This is a real obvious one. I'm just going to tell you because I don't, I don't want to torment you anymore. You're going to die. Sorry. Hate to break this to you, but you are. Death is a destroyer of wealth. You know, there are people who've had enormous amounts of wealth in the past that are dead now. And their wealth is gone. What happened to it? Why did it go away? Number two. Well, number two. Wealth destroyer is... Think of Mark Twain, taxes, and you are on the right track because the third destroyer of wealth is divorce. Guess what the fourth one is? Anybody want to guess on number four? This is a biggie. This is a huge one. In fact, so we know statistically in the, in the United States at least that Roughly half of marriages end in divorce. Let me say that roughly half of the families of people who have wealth end up fighting over it and having litigation over it when somebody dies. And it's even worse if the planning is inadequate. So family fights. How many people are going to end up needing long-term care before they die? Everybody who lives long, your, your option is you die young or you need long-term care before you die. Uh, how many people are going to become incapacitated during that long-term care? It's roughly one in four. And if we don't plan for that or prepare for that, how many of us own a business? If you own a business, there's huge risk associated with that. Car accidents is down there. And finally, the last one is friends. And we're going we're to talk about 
all these things as kind of they relate to. So what risk should we protect against first? Remember, the easiest and least expensive risk to protect against is the most likely to occur. So we should begin our asset protection planning with figuring out what's going to happen with our wealth when we die. As it turns out, when we do that, when we figure out what's going to happen with our wealth when we pass away, we end up resolving a lot of the asset protection issues as well. So I want to talk for a few minutes about what does it look like when you have a healthy relationship with money? What does it look like in a family? What does it look like in a business? What does it look like in a marriage? What does it look like when we do planning? And there are some features here that I want to illustrate. And most of these I'm going to tell you about now are available in an article, a white paper that I wrote called Leave Your Estate to Your Children Without Ruining Them, which is available to all of you if you ask for it. In fact, today, hopefully all of you have been given this evaluation form. If you'll fill this out, and when you put in there, give me your email address and say, give me that, leave your money to your kids thing, I'll email it to you for free. So we're, I want to identify some of the things that go into this. First of all, our planning has to include the idea that our money is going to outlive us. If our planning does not include that, it will be inadequate. There's two types of games in game theory. There's finite games and infinite games. Finite games have a beginning and an end. They have a discrete number of players. You know who wins by adding up the score at the end of the game, the high score wins, we divide up the prizes and we're done. An infinite game differs in this material respect. The game never ends, it just keeps going. The players come and go, the points come and go, the prizes come and go, and the way you win is you stay in the game. So most people plan their estates and plan their asset protection as a finite game. We're going to do this while I'm alive and when we're dead, we divide up the prizes and game over, we're done. Most trusts that we're going to talk about here in a minute do the same thing. The estate planning is focused on what happens when somebody dies and then we're through, we're finished. But if we're going to really protect it for a long time, we've got to think of our wealth as something that outlives us. It keeps going. Whoa, that got exciting. And I, I've already made this point, this kind of planning never happens by accident. Another curious thing with, with wealth, if you want your wealth, if you have children, I know some of you may not have children and, and there's a different kind of planning, but if you do have children or family members that you're leaving your wealth to them, they need to know it's coming. They need to see it. There's an idea that if I never tell my children about the wealth that they're going to inherit someday, that will prevent it from messing them up. And that is really a crazy, stupid idea. I just want to compare this to something obvious. That's like thinking, if I never talk to my child about sex, ever, someday they will marry a good, decent person, and they will have a healthy, happy relationship, and their marriage will thrive and succeed, with no input from me on what it means to have a healthy adult relationship with a spouse. You just got to understand that there's some parts of life that are happy, wonderful, beautiful, awesome, right person, right time, right place. It will make you healthier and happier and better. Wrong person, wrong time and place. And it's really destructive and, and going to hurt you. And I was talking about money. What were you thinking about? <laughs> it's money. You, got, you can't surprise them. Now, obviously, it's got to be age appropriate what you talk to them about. But you've got to be comfortable talking about money. You've got to share problem solving with your children. And I think that's next, no, almost next. So I, I want to give an illustration of this. I, there was some time ago when, when I was contemplating purchasing a new vehicle. And I talked with one of my children about what I was thinking. I talked out loud. I'm thinking of this vehicle right here. Here's the pros and cons. Here's what I like. Here's what I don't like. I got a good car. I kind of like the car I got. And I shared my thinking process, talked out loud with my child, and then said, what do you think? And got them to give me their opinion. Now, as it turns out, I made the decision. I was a grown-up, but because my child was involved in that, that was a learning experience for them. Another huge thing if you're comfortable talking about money, you can figure out how to solve problems. Guess what? 
If your children, if you have children, or if you have employees in a business, or whatever, if you have children, if they fight and do not get along and can't work together while you're living, is that going to get better or worse when you're dead? The time to teach a family member how to, re, how to deal with and resolve conflict in a healthy way is while you're alive. And then we have to build in tools that help make that happen when you're gone. Got to understand the difference between being a producer and a consumer. You know the difference? Consumers take, consumers take, producers make. And this has huge impacts socially, politically, mentally, emotionally, whether, whether they are able to thrive and be resilient. By the way, this is a big one too. If you don't own the problem, you can't fix the problem. When people blame others for their economic problems, they surrender the power to do something about it. To, to be responsible for where you are empowers you to get to where you want to be. So that accountability is a huge factor. And resilience and self reliance this, this is that dependency thing. Now, I get it. In fact, I heard uh, I was just at a summit for... Uh, international planning on some of these things. You've, everybody's heard that if you, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. If you teach him how to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. But there are some situations where if they don't get a fish today, they're not going to live long enough to learn how to fish tomorrow. So there are situations where we really do need to help people, but doing so in a way that at the end, they're able to stand on their own. They're not dependent and they're able to handle the difficulties that come along. And it's so easy to screw this up with money. One of the factors that we've observed, families that have a healthy relationship with wealth always have a culture of charitable giving. They do it together as a family. And finally, you know what right and wrong is. You incorporate that into your plan. You incorporate that into how you operate your business and do your planning. Now, these things sound, I don't know, kind of ethereal. How do you, how do you build this into an asset protection plan? Is this really asset protection? Yeah, I'm telling you. If, even if you protect your money while you're alive, if you hand it to your children and you have not prepared for these things, it will be gone within a generation. One of the factors we look at, in fact, that, that game, back to that game theory, the infinite game, to understand what's really good for a person, you have to contemplate not as just what's good for them today, you have to look at what is good for them over the entire span of their existence. So helping a child today with something in a cheap, easy, inexpensive economic problem is going to impact them long term. So how we do that makes a difference. So there are some things that go into a, an asset protection plan and a dynasty plan. And I'm going to put these tools up here. There are dynasty trusts. There are entities I call a family office and structures we can use for family office. There's the family bank and the family foundation. Now these are four kinds of things. They can take a, a great many shapes and a great many variations, but these concepts, if you get these tools, if you know what the tools are, you know what you can build, which is why I'm introducing them here. A lot of people run out and say, I want to do asset protection, but they don't know what the tools are. They don't know what they can build. They, don't, they haven't answered the first three questions we started with. What are we protecting? What are we protecting it from? And who are we protecting it for? Once you know those three, then well, what, what have I got to build? How can I build this plan? So I want to hit all three of these. The dynasty trust is where we build in the succession, where we take care of the, of the family members, where we address estate tax issues, which uh, there are many taxes that are voluntary. We can eliminate some of the taxes right there in that entity. The family office is where we have control. We create jobs. We do tax planning. We take tax deductions, which our ability to take deductions today for genuine, real business purposes has become increasingly significant under the current tax law, and I think it will continue to be so. The family bank is where we put the stuff that we're trying to protect, and that's one of the factors that gives us the protection, and we can loan money to family members. By the way, just as a comment, that loan money to family members that you see up there, it's far better to loan children money than to distribute children money for a whole bunch of reasons. It's a completely different seminar. And the Family Foundation. 
there are a bunch of articles recently, in fact, if you Google what, what, what is the, are the ultra-wealthy doing with their money to prevent the government from confiscating it from them, and they're using family foundations in some very powerful ways. And one of, our, one of my affiliates is Legacy Global Foundation, and we have a representative from them here today, and you can meet them at our booth. So we're going to talk about all four of these in a little bit here, because we just have a little bit of time to touch on each of these. The Dynasty Trust, again, remember, the Dynasty Trust is designed not for just what's going to happen during my lifetime and when I die, but what's going to happen a long time after me. So we build in some things. They can be, these trusts can be revocable. They can be irrevocable. They have to be funded. i got to tell you, I review thousands of trusts every year. I see, I, at events like this, I meet people and say, will you review me a trust? And I go, yeah, I'll review it. You should bring, bring it on. Let me see it. The number one thing I find, that's why I listed this first. The number one thing I find, people say, I have a trust, and I'll look at it. Sometimes it'll be a perfectly good trust. Yeah, this is a great trust. Does it own your assets? No. Well, then you might as well not have one. It's like buying a nice car and throwing the keys in the river and never driving it, letting it sit in your driveway until it rusts into pieces. You have a trust, you got to put your assets in it. If you don't do that, you don't, might as well not have one. Now, trusts can do a whole lot of different things, and I see some questions. Hang on to your questions and come see me afterwards. Uh, this format does not lend itself well to questions, so come see me at the booth or talk with me afterwards. I'm, I love and welcome questions, all we can get. Uh, trusts can do a lot of different things. And a lot of planners will do a couple of things. They'll either charge by the piece. You tell me what you want, and okay, we'll add up the pieces, and our price will reflect that. Or my approach is I just put all the tools in the trust. And I want to note something here that's significant. I've been doing this for now more than three decades. And when I started in this field more than 30 years ago, in fact, I will just tell you, the first trust I prepared, I prepared on a selectric typewriter where we had to type every word of the dumb thing. It was tedious and, and difficult. I have lived through the computer revolution with trust. In the early days, a lawyer or someone preparing trust, they had no choice but to prepare and own their own forms. They had to develop them and own them. So they knew what they said because they made them. One of the things that's happened with the computer age is lawyers almost never own their own forms anymore. They rent them, or they buy them by the piece. They subscribe to a service, and they say, oh, I need a trust that does one of these, and one of these, and one of these, and they download it from the internet, and you could have downloaded the same thing if you subscribed to the same service that they have. So this is just my opinion. I own my own forms. I developed them personally, and I've developed them personally over the last 30 years. So I think they're kind of better than the other guys. By the way, when I review all these trusts that I see other people have, if I find a good idea I haven't used yet, I steal it. So, so I end up, I have all their good ideas, but they don't have mine. So we put all the tools in the trust. It's got to be value-driven. We've talked about that quite a bit. It's got to have dispute resolution built in. Listen, there are law firms that prepare trusts that deliberately leave questions unanswered, and flaws in the trust, knowing that they're going to result in conflict in the family, and they say, ah, oh, it's no big deal. When we hit that conflict somewhere down the road, we can just take that to court. What does that mean? It guarantees a family fight. It guarantees legal fees. I hate that attitude, and yet I encounter it all the time among law firms. And they go, no, no, this is business generation. We don't want to just get the trust today. We want to have all the service of that trust going on in the future. For example, we want to be able to go to court over the trust in the future. I hate that idea. It's far better, in my view, to build the trust with provisions that allow the family to resolve conflict without going to court. Uh, you've got to have spendthrift provisions. By the way, spendthrift provisions are one of the number one ways that we can use a trust to protect against all those bad things. How many of us are likely to have a divorce occur in our family, either in our generation or in our children's generation? How many of us are likely to have somebody in our family die? Ooh. How many of us are likely to have somebody in our family get sued or file bankruptcy or have a medical disaster or have a substance abuse problem or go to jail? The list goes on and on and on. A trust, if it has spent through provisions, can protect assets from that. I have to make a point here, too. You see the revocable and the irrevocable up there. If your trust is revocable, even if it has spendthrift provisions, 
It does not protect your assets from your liabilities while you're alive. To get asset protection with a revocable trust, you have to die first. And in my experience, most people prefer to avoid that for as long as possible. So if you're going to do asset protection, you're going to have, in addition to a revocable trust, you're going to have an irrevocable trust. Because we can set up an irrevocable trust in a way that it is protected now. And by the way, I want to hit something right now too. Trust can be formed anywhere in the world with a few exceptions. There are some countries that are hostile to trust, but most places in the world you can form a trust. You can form them here, you can form them offshore. And one of the things I think this is coming up here. Oh, discretion. I'm going to pop down here. I'm going to put a whole bunch of stuff up here and we'll talk about it again here because probably the last one, jurisdiction independent. I jumped, I got ahead of myself. So making a trust jurisdiction independent makes it possible that it can follow you wherever you go. Most of the people I work with aren't going to stay in one place forever, and their children aren't going to stay in that place, and they're going to have assets that aren't in that one place. So why should we make our trust stuck in one place? Let's make it so it can move. It can move with the people. It can move with the things. And if we need to, we can take it offshore. Sometimes doing offshore planning is really, really a good idea. Sometimes it's really, really a terrible idea. And in my experience, the people who make the decision of whether or not to go offshore or stay onshore are usually not qualified to make that decision. A couple of other things with all these bullet points I put up there. For the spendthrift provisions to work, distributions must be discretionary. What the vast majority of trusts have out there are age-based mandatory distributions. They say, when the beneficiaries have a birthday, give them the money. Which, what is that? That's a finite game. Game over, we're done. Trust ends, the kids got the money, they got the prize money, they take their, they take their goodies and they go home and they spend it and have a good time. They're chopping down the tree, folks. If you want the money to last, it's got to stay in the trust, and distributions are discretionary, and they come out based upon your values, which are expressed in statements of wishes, and we want to protect the corpus. Here's, protecting the principle, here's this idea. Most of the time, when, when we're talking about children, again, if you don't have children, I apologize. We have other ways of planning for that, which I will address if I can talk fast enough. Uh, wow, i got to talk a lot faster. Uh, most of us, we're not going to inherit anything until we're old. Most people inherit when they're at or near retirement. And most people, if they have brains, don't consume their inheritance. It helps them out. They pay off their house. They finance their retirement a little bit, but they add that wealth to their own wealth, and then they pass it on to the next generation. So why not anticipate that and plan for it? And there are some very powerful things we can do. Uh, trust protectors, multi-generation. I just got to move on because we don't have time to talk about all this kind of stuff. But I want to illustrate this concept of dynasty. So we're going to start out with $5 million when somebody dies, and we're going to make all those assumptions you see up there. And this is just a concept. Reality would obviously be a little different, but in generation one, after, after a generation, that money doubles, and then somebody dies. And when they die, if they've done no planning, they're going to pay a tax. But if they've done planning, no tax. And by the way, this is based upon the law assuming the sunset provision that's going to happen in 2026. The current exclusion from estate taxes lasts until 2026, and then it goes back to where it used to be. So generation two, it grows now, and then there's another tax. Generation, it grows again. There's another tax. Generation four, it grows again, and there's another tax. And at the end, you can see the dynasty planning where we experience no, no taxes over five generations is almost five times bigger. And one family paid nearly $25 million in taxes while the other one paid nothing. Let me just say that there are ultra-wealthy families that five generations ago started with less than a million dollars and today are in this league, some of them multi-billionaires. And they got there because they planned and structured their assets in a way that they didn't lose the benefits of compound interest and appreciation to those nasty little capital gains taxes and estate taxes. I, the family office is pretty significant. I, I want to throw this up here and, and not spend a lot of time on it, largely because there's some more that we want to talk about. If you have money, you are going to want a family office. If you 
don't have money today, but you're going to have money someday, it's better to start early and figure out how they are. Now, you can pay somebody else to do the family office function for you, or you can set up your own family office and enjoy the benefits of it. This is something that the ultra-wealthy all do. They do this. There's fam family offices. Maybe some of you in here have family offices. But a family office is something that can be democratized. People on the front end of wealth accumulation can en enjoy the benefits of a family office, especially if we're doing asset protection. So this is where we put control, and I'm, I'm going to go through this quickly because, again, we just have a lot of ground to cover. The family bank, this is very significant, and I, I want to uh, point out, this can be an LLC or a limited partnership. It depends on your jurisdiction. Some places one is better than the other. That's one of the advantages of having clients in all 50 states. I learned some states are better at things than other states, and we can help you figure out where the best location to do this. This is where we're going to put stuff. And you see, I got the blue trust, which is the revocable one, and the green trust, which is the irrevocable trust. We form a partnership between those two trusts, and then we put your stuff in that partnership. By doing that, we make the stuff that we put in this family bank entity unavailable to your creditors. And the timing of this is significant. There's some technicalities here that we don't really have a lot of time to address, but we can do all kinds of Planning with it, I want, to, I want to show you the kinds of things that we put in this family bank. All of your portfolio assets, we make uh, loans to family members. We're going to put a mortgage on your house uh, secured by a deed of trust so that we can protect the equity in your house from other people. And then if you have uh, other properties or, or, or assets that have liability associated with them, we're going to wrap them in their own an entity so that we can contain that risk so it doesn't spill out and, and contaminate all the rest. Again, these can be domestic or multinational. We can form these all over the world, wherever they need to be. The family bank will be controlled by the family office. And finally, I want to hit upon this family foundation idea. Family foundations are a tool that the ultra-wealthy are using. Everybody else, if they want to get what the ultra-wealthy have in terms of finances, will figure out what these do and work with them as well. So we're going to talk about a couple of reasons why. You can make tax-deductible contributions. This money can be invested as an endowment. You can use your money managers if you are on the correct platform. And I, you see Legacy Global Foundation up there. There are many, many providers of donor advice funds. There's Fidelity, Vanguard, Schwab, a, a bunch of others, a lot of community foundations, a lot of colleges and universities, a lot of hospitals. Every brand name church on the planet has a, has a donor advice fund. There's a reason why I prefer Legacy Global Foundation other than the fact that I happen to be on their board of directors, but they are independent. They are not tied to any platform. They are not tied to any geography. They can give anywhere in the world. They can receive contributions from anywhere in the world. They can deal with alternative assets, and they'll work with your financial advisors. And my daughter runs it, and she's awesome. So uh, I prefer uh, Legacy for a whole bunch of reasons, some of which I've listed. So the grants to charities of your choice can happen. And this, of course, is part of creating that culture of charitable giving in your family. You can create these tools for very little money. It does not take a lot of money to create that family foundation, but it becomes a powerful tool. Now, I want to talk to you about some applications of this stuff in the next little bit of time that we have before we run out of time here. Uh, and one, one of the biggies is capital gains. Capital gains, like estate taxes, there are several taxes that are completely optional. Capital gains is one of them. A lot of people don't get this. Remember, we're going we're gonna to prevent the risk from what? The lowest cost risk we can prevent first from death, taxes, divorce, family fights. Capital gains is one of those. A lot of wealth gets lost to capital gains. So that fair market value above the cost of a property is taxable. That tax is deferred until there's a taxable event, which is usually the sale of a, of a property. The tax rate is political. It changes all the time. In the last 12 years, I don't know, it's probably changed four or five times nationally and several times locally, depending on your jurisdiction. That taxable event, you get to control this tax is, again, voluntary. We don't want to pay unless we have to. So here's, here's this magic box I want you to think about for a minute. 
If you could pour money into this black box and we have highly appreciated assets and there's no capital gains when you sell that. And in fact, when you put money, when you pour your money into the black box, you get a tax deduction. And then you get tax advantaged income for the rest of your life. We create tax free money for your wealth, for, uh, for your heirs that we're going to employ in this dynasty plan, this asset protection plan. And we also get to fund your charitable intent. Do you care what's in the black box? Do you really care? Do you really care? Even if it's giving money away to charity on buying life insurance? I don't sell life insurance. I'm a lawyer. You can't buy life insurance from me. But I'm smart enough to know how to use it in an asset protection plan and in a dynasty estate plan. So I want to hit this really quick. This is fun. You can divide up an asset in a lot of ways. You can divide it up with a fence down the middle. You can divide it up over time. We're going to divide assets up between their income and their residue. And you are going to keep the income piece for the rest of your life and give away the residue to charity when you die. And it makes sense if it's got to go to charity when you die, that that charity be your own family foundation, right? Where your children and your family can participate in using, employing that uh, political or that social capital to support things that matter to you. This can be done as an annuity. It can be done as a trust. And then you use private contractual alternatives to the government plan to replace that asset when you die to provide tax-free benefits to your, well, to your children. So I want you to see what this CRT looks like if we can avoid this capital gains. So we're going to sell a million-dollar property. We're going to assume, I think this, this illustration here assumes people that are at like 72 years old. Uh, if you have no CRT, you're going to pay nearly $300,000 in taxes. With the CRT, there's zero capital gains tax, but you can, instead you get a $300,000 tax deduction. Would you rather have a $300,000 tax or a $300,000 deduction? Which would be better for you? I don't know. Uh, so then you get the net after that. We invest that. It produces an income. You pay some premiums over the rest of your lifetime. You're able to spend the difference. And then when you die, we're going to assume this is included in your taxable estate. You may or may not have a taxable estate depending on how much other stuff you have. And then you see the net to heirs and net to charity. This is a powerful tool. Does everybody need one? No. Who needs one? If you have highly appreciated assets. I want to talk about overfunded IRA because more people have this than other things. So people pile all this money into, into IRAs. And why do they pile money into the IRA? It's kind of a sucker punch. We put money into the IRA because we get a tax deduction. We avoid a tax today, but have we avoided the tax forever? No, we've merely deferred the tax. Unless it's a Roth, and then we have not avoided the tax, we've paid the tax up front. And the Roth, we're going to come to this, the Roth was actually designed to compete for the government to compete with a private contractual alternative. So those taxes... There's a whole bunch of them that happen. We only ultimately use that portion of our retirement plan, which we take out during our retirement. A lot of people forget the I and the R in IRA stands for individual retirement. That's the retirement of one person. The most tax efficient use of an IRA is its statutory purpose. When we try to use an IRA for its non-statutory purpose, we maximize the tax revenue to the IRS and minimize the benefit to our family. Is that what you want? Wait, I want to pay the most taxes and my family gets the least? That's not what I want. Who wants to pay that? So what's the private contractual alternative? By, by the way, is this an asset protection thing? I can tell you at this conference, people will come up to me because they always do. Oh, I have buku bucks in my IRA. I want one. I say, well, are you going to use that during your retirement? Oh, no. In fact, I'm really mad that I have to take a required minimum distributions. That's really upsetting me. What do you want to do with your IRA? I wanted to go to my kids. Well, do you know how much of it's going to get there? They want all of it to go to the kids, and it's not all going to go to their kids because there's all these layers of taxes. So... 
Who, we, we, what does tax exempt mean? You know that tax exempt is better than tax deferred, right? Okay, tax exempt means no tax. So an obvious one is churches. If you're a church or a religion, you're exempt from certain taxes. Then the next obvious one, everybody's heard of these and dealt with them. 501c something organizations, and there's a variety of them. The most common one is a 501c3. But how many of you have heard of Section 101 and 7702? What, what are those? What's that that's exempt from taxes? What is that? It's the private contractual alternative. And I'll, I'll tell you, this is in here because I speak to some libertarian groups that if I say, would you rather have the government plan? You know, if you don't have a plan for what's going to happen with your stuff when you die, the politicians have one for you. Their plan is based upon maximizing tax revenue so the politicians can control what happens. Your plan might have different goals than their plan. Which one would you prefer to have? So this the tax-exempt family bank strategy, IRAs, and traditional retirement plans are not tax-exempt. They are. You're going to pay a tax. So this is, guess what? Yes. Again, I'm a lawyer. You can't buy life insurance from me. I don't sell it. I never get paid when somebody buys life insurance but I'm smart enough to know how to use it in an estate plan, in an asset protection plan. Something that the life insurance people you go talk to are reluctant to tell you because this structure that I'm showing you here minimizes their compensation. So they're, they have an incentive not to tell you this. To use life insurance as an asset class, you need a low death benefit and a high cash value. It's counterintuitive. That you just won't hear this out there. And it's got to be owned by your dynasty trust, of course. If you buy life insurance and you pay premiums to insure against the possibility of your passing away and you don't put it in a trust, you wasted your money. And again, I want to show you how to get out. If you've already there and you've already got this big fat IRA, how do you get out of it? How do we protect the assets in that IRA from the number one risk, which is you're going to die and pay taxes? How do we protect for that? You take distributions out of that IRA. They can be your RMDs or otherwise. You make gifts to a dynasty trust, and in that dynasty trust, you're going to buy some life insurance, and then you set up at your death... A family foundation, so the money goes there. And what happens now when you die? How much of your IRA gets confiscated in taxes? And the answer is zero. And instead of the money going to pay the tax man, your children get the tax-free, tax-exempt benefits in the dynasty islet, and the rest of the money that would have been confiscated by the politicians goes to your family foundation where... Instead of the politicians deciding what's going to happen with it, you decide. I kind of like that. So all the three of these things work together. And I'm just going to skip this because I want to hit a couple of things in our last few minutes. If you wanted to do this asset protection, there's three costs that you have to consider. Anybody that's looking at asset protection. Number one cost is setting it up. And how much you do, where you do it, the jurisdictions you do it in or don't do it in, how complicated or how simple you get, th that all drives this setup cost. The second cost is you have to maintain it. Same thing. If you're offshore, maintenance costs are super high. One of the biggest reasons I help, for every person I take offshore, I bring a couple of them back, domesticated. One of the big reasons is the offshore stuff, it's expensive. And the third cost is, if you're going to do asset protection, your life will be complicated. That is a real cost. I have people say, I just want everything to be simple and protected. Can't do it, sorry. That's like saying, I want to make a gajillion dollars and pay zero income tax. Ain't going to happen. Years ago, I had a client that was, I was saying how terrible it is to pay income taxes. This was when I was a very young lawyer, and he was a very wealthy man. 
And he finally, emotionally, not physically, but he emotionally slapped me and said, shut up, you're being stupid. And he said to me, my goal is to pay as much as I possibly can in taxes. I don't want to pay a penny more than I have to, but I want to pay as much as I can. And he said, last year I paid a million dollars in taxes. That was a good year. I would like to do that year over and over again. So paying taxes is not evil. We don't want to pay any more than we have to, but we should pay as much as we possibly can. So we've spent the last 45 minutes together. Hopefully during this time, you've had something pop into your mind that, oh, I really ought to do fill in the blank, whatever that is. Whatever that is for you, I'm going to invite you, challenge you, encourage you to do two things. Write it down, number one, and then do it. The odds of it actually getting done will increase dramatically if you'll go ahead and write it down. I need to call. I need to set up. I need to talk to whatever that is. If you want to talk to myself, to a representative Legacy Global Foundation, to my uh, associate and affiliate who's here who happens to be at our booth, David Phillips, you can schedule free appointments with us for the time we're here. Uh, Melody at the back of the room has our appointment calendar. Come see us at booth 10. Turn in your evaluation form. Tell me if you want that free white paper. Uh, go visit the website, derfylawgroup.com. Uh, I hope that uh, you enjoyed this. If you have questions, I'm technically over time right now. So I'm happy to visit with any of you or all of you. Come see me. We're at booth 410. Uh, and again, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here.